the immeasurable grace of Christ Jesus, the rich mercy of God, and the unity of the Holy Spirit be with you all. pray. Holy God, Heavenly Father, in the waters of the flood you saved the chosen, and in the wilderness of temptation you protected your Son from sin. Renew us in the gift of baptism. May your holy angels be with us, that the wicked foe have no power over us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Gospel according to Saint Mark. Glory to you, Lord. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven You are my Son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days tempted by Satan. And he was with wild beasts. And the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The Gospel of the Lord. I imagine that most of you have seen in our nursery that cute mural of Noah's Ark on the wall. The animals all lined up two by two, as the Bible song puts it. Elephants and kangaroo rooey. <laughs> when our girls were little, they had a toy ark with Noah and his family and an assortment of paired animals. 
And I remember reading them a children's account of the story, beautifully illustrated in watercolor. Come to think of it, watercolor was an appropriate medium. But funny thing, you know, in none of those renderings, mural, toy, book, were there any dead bodies floating on the water or animal carcasses lying about when things finally dried off. There was none of the horror of last year's tsunami in Japan, no indication even of Noah's sorrow over the terrible loss of all of his family and friends. I trust you've noticed that account from Genesis is far from being a children's story. Rather, it is a tale of the dreadful struggle between the Creator God and His wayward creatures. Here, a mere five chapters after everything was created good, the Lord returns His earth to those chaotic waters in an attempt to start all over again. As Genesis 6, 1 puts it, the earth was corrupt in God's sight and filled with violence. God decided he simply could not take any more of the selfishness, the lying, and the warring of those who were made in his image. Genesis tells us that even gentle grazing animals had developed a taste for blood, so they too were washed away. Of all the earth, only Noah is privy to God's plan and only the only one righteous enough to be saved along with his wife and children and their spouses. It's pretty clear, I think, that this story is a pain field tragedy far more than it is an early version of Love Boat. But here in today's reading, something remarkable is going on. I hope you caught it. It is, I think, a moment of breathtaking poignancy and insight as four times God promises never to destroy the earth that way again. You've got to read between the lines a bit, but it seems to me pretty clear that God had serious misgivings about that flood. It was as if God didn't fully anticipate the horror of all of those lost lives or the pain of his own grief and loss. Biblical scholars feel that the story of Noah was written down in its present form while the Israelites were in exile in Babylon. That's a telling understanding, I think. There they were, a conquered people far away from home, longing for return. They had a lot of time on their hands in that foreign exile, and they must have thought a great deal about the kind of God they had. Other people and religions, including the Babylonians, had their own flood stories and their gods of vengeance. But Israel's God, they discovered, had a heart. A heart that could grieve with them and for them. And even more, they discovered that God had a heart that could change to deliver them from punishment to blessing. As God makes his first covenant in scripture, did you notice how it almost sounds like a confession? I'll never do it again, he promises. God is so deeply affected that he even makes that covenant unilaterally. Most covenants have promises going in both directions. You do this for me and I'll do that for you. But here it is a one-way street. God asks nothing of his people at all. Rather, everything comes from him. And then there's that marvelous piece about God hanging his bow in the sky. Nevermore will that bow be a weapon of destruction. Instead, the rainbow becomes a beautiful peace symbol, reminding God generation after generation to keep his promise. Think of it. God sacrifices his own freedom in order to protect and preserve those he loves. 
Isn't this the most amazing picture of God? I mean, to think that our God can have misgivings about what he's done. This God can regret and repent and change heart. What a wonderful model for us. God even needs reminders like the rainbow. Don't do it again. You see what this picture brings us? The understanding that Israel's God is not above and beyond the world, quite the contrary. Israel's God is closely bound to his creatures. I promise, I promise, I promise, he repeats. More than just a God of justice and righteousness, every nation had them. Here, here is a God of grace and everlasting love. That love is put to the test almost immediately. Not long after disembarking, Noah's fun's sons find him drunk and naked, lying in a cave. Definitely not a children's story. And from there it goes on to the Tower of Babel and Sodom and Gomorrah, story after story of disobedience, unfaithfulness, wars, rebellion, and treachery. But running through all of that muck and mess is God's relentless devotion to his people. It is love and grace that takes us all the way to the waters of Jesus' baptism in the Jordan and to the cosmic struggle that, with Satan that his son encounters in the wilderness. Did you notice as I was reading it how different Mark's account is compared to the ones we're used to hearing from Matthew and Luke. First of all, it is by far the shortest account. Mark mentions no specific temptations. He doesn't talk about stone into bread or jumping from the pinnacle of the temple or looking at all the kingdoms of the earth. Mark just says, Jesus was tempted for 40 days by Satan and angels served him, period. While we might, I suppose, miss some of the details of the other Gospels, to me, Mark's brevity leaves much more to the imagination. It's not just three temptations, bang, 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 but rather 40 days of it, days and nights of prodding, cajoling, wrestling, enticing, giving Jesus a foretaste of what his ministry would encounter in the years to come and providing Jesus as well with a taste of what you and I encounter every day. Am I right? See, in this whole grand story of God's love affair with his people, creation, rejection, flood, sin, exile, prophets, and more, God finally decides on an ultimate plan. God decides to become one of us. God takes on our flesh to know firsthand our struggles and frailty, even succumbing to our death. All of this to show the breadth and the depth of his love. Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness is highly symbolic. It retraces Israel's 40 years of stumbling in the desert and discovering their absolute dependence upon God. It also reflects, reflects the 40 days that Moses and Elijah spent on Mount Sinai, preparing each of them for the challenges that lay ahead. And it's also a reminder of the 40 days of rain, which brought the whole world to a place of new beginning, very much like the waters of our own baptism. Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness is a way of connecting him to us, to our struggles and challenges, to our infirmities and our mortality. The temptations were for him a training ground so that he could tackle our penchant for turning our backs on our loving creator, for chasing after the very things we know can diminish us and ultimately destroy us. Wild beasts and angels were with him, Mark writes. 
I'm sure you've seen the cartoon rendering of the person with the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other, both of them speaking into the ears. And while I suppose that's supposed to be funny, that is uh, hardly humorous. It is rather a picture of the struggles that you and I encounter, I suspect, day after day. We are engaged in that wrestling match and so often hard to tell which one is whispering in our ear. Isn't it the case there are times when we know what is right, sometimes we follow it, sometimes we reject it. We know what is wrong, sometimes we avoid it, sometimes we embrace it. But there are also those times when it is frankly hard to distinguish one from the other because Satan is so clever in his disguises, lovely to look at, delightful to hold. That's one of the reasons, I think, these 40 days of Lent are so important to us. Most of you were marked with the ashes of our mortality this past Wednesday, a reminder of our absolute need for God. You gathered here again today for word and sacrament. Please hear God's invitation to you to join in this annual Lenten training camp of prayer, devotion, scripture, self-giving, conversation, self-denial, all of those things coming together as a way of sharpening our discernment of good and evil. And as a means of strengthening our determination to follow God's way. Lent is a holy season of the year, a time to bring us closer to God and to each other, to build up Christ's body so that light and life can triumph over the forces of darkness and death. I have no idea what season of the year Martin Luther may have written our sending hymn today but it strikes me as a positively wonderful way to begin Lent. A mighty fortress has often been nicknamed a battle hymn of the, Re of the Reformation, likely referring to battling Rome. But I think that Luther really nails it as a hymn for our daily struggles in the wilderness. It is a hymn to inspire us as we wrestle with you-know-who. Though hordes of devils fill the land, all threatening to devour us, we tremble not, unmoved we stand. They cannot overpower us. Let this world's tyrant rage, in battle we'll engage. His might is doomed to fail, God's judgment must prevail. One little word subdues him. One little word, that word with God at the beginning of time made flesh in Bethlehem for us now in book and water, bread and wine, alive in us and through us. That little word is our strength and our hope and our salvation. God's word forever shall abide, no thanks to those who fear it. For God himself fights by our side with weapons of the Spirit. May God ever be with us. May God grant us a blessed bodybuilding Lent and so prepare us for Easter victory through Christ our Lord. Amen.
you're invited to sit or kneel for the prayers. We cry for, to you for help, O oh God, praying for the church, the world, and all those who are in need. We pray for the whole Church of Christ in this season of Lent, for the ELCA and our full communion partners, for our congregation and other churches in our communities, especially our covenant partners, Christ Episcopal Church and Father John, the people of St. James Lutheran Church, and the congregation and staff of Freedens Lutheran Church in Burnville. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for wild beasts, birds, domestic animals, and every living creature, for the wilderness and its preservation, for rain enough to bring abundant fruits, especially for those who hunger most. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our we pray for those who have been ravaged by floods, for those who provide leadership in times of chaos, for disaster relief workers and aid organizations, especially in Africa and the Middle East. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for our shut-ins and those who live in care facilities, for those who seek your strengthening of body, mind or spirit, especially Catherine Moyer, Cindy Shirek, Jan Rita Clemenson, Bill Fitzcharles, Rendell Wolf, Dave McCanny, Nan Potiger, Bill Davidson, Martha Tobias, Marie Schweigert, Pastor Eckhart Grimm, and those others we now name. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for this community of faith, for single people, for married couples, and those who are divorced, for widows and widowers, for children and youth, for all who come here in need of good news. Bless our sisters and brothers whom we remember in prayer this week. Carol Miller, Ernestine Miller, Jeremiah and Adrian Motley, Joshua, Christine, and Jacinda Motley, Ben, CJ, Kobe, and Mackenzie Motley, and Linda Motley. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We thank you for the everlasting covenant you have made with all flesh, and we remember our ancestors and loved ones who know the fulfillment of your promises, especially Betty Wagner and those others dear to us who rest in you. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Now is the acceptable time to offer our prayers to you, God of grace and truth. Receive them in your mercy and grant us all that we need in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 